Good evening, everyone. Come on, stand with me. Welcome, everyone, to Presence 2021, where we're celebrating 50 years of ministry, 50 years in the presence of God. In a couple minutes, we're going to begin our time of worship. Got a couple announcements for you, just very brief. Please just water only in the sanctuary. And uh, don't forget the product table when you leave tonight. We've got voice activated. We've got worship. We've got presents, T-shirts and shirts. Beautiful, huh? I want to start tonight with a shout. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is what I want us to say. I'm going to have you say it right after me. I'm going to say Jesus Christ is Lord, and you're going to say it right after me. And we're going to do that three times, and then we'll begin. Amen? You ready? Jesus Christ is Lord. 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 Hallelujah. Let's worship him.
just cry out for you the living God I ask no more than this to see the living God mm. oh I want to see My soul follows. My soul follows after you. After you, How about we let the people of God shout in the room right now? Now that's just the typical church shout that we do when somebody says shout. Now I really want you to shout. I want you to shout because the Bible says to shout. I want you to shout with authority knowing that we can shift the atmosphere in the city. Shout! Open arms, 
ain't a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. I try with all my might. I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. A bag of bones. Just when.
the Savior because He healed my heart, changed my name.
after all these years, yeah, yeah. can you still be desperate after 50 years? Can you still be long after all? You've got more for us, more for us. We still want more. Pour it out, pour it out. Cause you've got more, more, more for us. We want more, we want more, we want more, we want more, we want more. There's always, there's totally always, completely always, consumed always, by you. Always, always, always. Come up here. Come. John was having the encounter of a life. He beheld the Son of Man standing between the candlesticks, standing in the middle of the churches. He saw the white hair and the, the glorious one 
surely the high water mark of all that he had ever known. But then he heard a voice and he turned to see the voice. He turned to see the voice and he saw a door open and the voice said, come up higher. There's always more, higher heights, deeper depths. Just when you think you've seen it all, he says, come up.
people say
How we love you, Jesus. Oh, we adore you. Oh, how we love you, Jesus, Jesus. Sing your own song to Jesus tonight. Sing your own song to Jesus tonight. Sing in the spirit. Sing in the natural. Sing your song to Jesus. Sing your song to Jesus. Love songs to Jesus. How we love you. Would you just pray for the person on your right and to your left right now? Just begin to lift up their name. If you don't know their name, that's fine. This is a great time to just love on your brother and sister right now. Just pray that they'll receive tonight everything that the Father has for them. That the Lord who gives them the desires of their heart would be ever present in this room. We pray for one another tonight. We pray for miracles, signs, and wonders. We pray for healing. We remember the broken body of Christ, his blood shed for us, and we we remember tonight the sacrifice, the finished work of Christ on the cross and all the completion that we receive from Jesus. And we bless our brother and we bless our sister. We pray for the body of Christ tonight. That it would be well with them. Every need met. Jesus, you'd be glorified in our temple tonight. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Whoa. Thank you, Lord. Yay, God. <laughs> you can find your seat. So honored that you have joined us tonight on the final night of Presence 2021, where we are celebrating 50 years of ministry life at Covenant Church of Pittsburgh. Would you just thank the Lord for that in a, in a one-time shout? Yeah, and an applause. Thank you, Lord. Oh, look at that. It just shows up. Is this the kind that comes up from the stage? or it just, It's a little tall for that, but well, we have an amazing, uh, the Lord has an amazing night uh, planned tonight. We have so many dynamics and such that we want to just honor the Lord and what he's done, what he's accomplished, and how he's been glorified uh, through Covenant Church of Pittsburgh, and, and particularly through the ministry of Bishop Joseph and Pastor Barbara Garlington. And we're so thankful that you have chosen to join with us. And, and for everyone watching right now on live stream, we have so many from around the world who weren't able to travel in due to obvious reasons. And we just bless you tonight. And, and many of you are watching this first thing in the morning. So we're glad that you're with us. And we celebrate the fact that we have family all over the world uh, who's with Covenant Church of Pittsburgh. And you're celebrating Bishop Joseph and Pastor Barbara as well. So please let us know where you're watching from and send your greetings as well. And we'll make sure that they receive them. Thank you so much. Well, we would love for you to turn your eyes to the screen and take a look at this. 
I wanted to start a church here in Pittsburgh where the Holy Spirit would be free to do whatever he wanted to do, invite whoever he wanted to invite. This is the kind of word that can alter the course of your life. You see, if you want to see what's unseen, you got to say what's unsaid. like it wants to budge, if it seems like it's impregnable, if it seems like it's not coming down, you, you don't shout to get it down, you shout because it is down. Say yes to something fresh. We have a special guest with us today. His name is Bill Thimelaris. We are kings and priests in this world and in the kingdom of God, and we're praying that the kingdom of heaven as it is in heaven, let it be on earth. And that's what we do with prophetic worship and intercession. What's in heaven is Nations, tribes, tongues, all together worshiping God. And that is what I believe the world needs to see in any kind of worship experience. We're trusting that as we move in this dimension of worship and praise, he can't help but come. And when he comes, he brings stuff with him. We want to take a few moments right here and hear from a few people who have been very dear to the heart of Bishop uh, Joseph and Pastor Barbara and, and, and likewise in relationship. And we've been able to hear from testimonies from people each and every week. So I'd like to invite uh, Pastor Bob and Trisha Menges to the podium right now. Some of the longest serving members of Covenant Church of Pittsburgh and you're alive and well, and you're looking as best as ever. Just come right on up here. And... Thank you, Pastor Bill. I'm going to let you go first, my love. This is the better part here. <laughs> I'm surprised you're letting me talk. <laughs> it never goes well. I was asked to give announcements probably 40 years ago. Simple. I was supposed to tell everybody that somebody had died and where the funeral was, that's it. And in my head, I was thinking, well, and I'll just say, well, if she can't be with us, we're glad she's with Jesus. But what I said was, she passed away, and we're so glad she's gone. <laughs> Wasn't good. I've not given announcements since. <laughs> and it's wise, that's good. Um, I've heard a lot of folks come up and talk about how they met Bishop. 
and you know it was anointed time and God appointed and 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 my experience wasn't quite like that um, <laughs> Bobby was selling paint and he got a call that there was this pastor Joe who needed paint and so would we deliver some to him so we drove to Knoxville we walked in the sanctuary and there's this guy up on a ladder painting the sanctuary all by himself and he looked down at me he smiled and he said have you ever seen a harder working bastard <laughs> now I'd been a Christian about six minutes but I was pretty sure that wasn't cool <laughs> and and so on the way home Bobby says hey let's go to their church let's try it out and I said uh, no <laughs> being the submissive wife that I am all the time so after a couple of weeks, Bobby said, why won't you go with me, try this church? I said, he swore at us within a minute of meeting him. He's like, what? I said, yeah, remember he said, have you ever seen a harder working bastard? He said, Trisha, he said, have you ever seen a harder working pastor? <laughs> so we visited. That was about 50 years ago, and, and we never left. Still here. <laughs> Eventually, Bishop hired me, because I think he figured I wasn't going to go anywhere, so he might as well give me a job. So about the last 10 years, I think, I worked here, I was in charge of special projects. And he would call me in the office, and he would paint a picture because he's a visionary and tell me what he wanted me to do and I'd write notes and I'd nod my head like sure okay and then I would leave his office go down the hall into the bathroom shut the door and cry and I would just say God did you, I don't know how to do any of that stuff that he just said but you know what he believed I could and when somebody like that believes you can you do things that's not in your wheelhouse you do things that you never thought you could do. And I'm so grateful that he not only gave me a place to do the things, he believed that I could do it. And he didn't just send me out there and leave me. He'd call me, he'd say, how you doing? You okay? What do you need? How can I help? He was there. And Pastor Barbara, good golly, she's like a spiritual stick of dynamite waiting to go off. And she's so much fun. She asked me one time, Ooh, I think I was in my 20s, and she felt like it was time I learned how to pray for deliverance for somebody. So she invited me in, and we went in this room. <laughs> and um, it was just three of us, and, and so she started praying for this lady who got on her hands and knees and started crawling around the room. And then Pastor Barbara got on her hands and knees, and she's following this lady around the room. <laughs> Now I'm thinking, okay, there's three of us in here and two of us are on the floor, so I, I'm going to do it. So I got on the floor and I'm just following him around. And she's binding stuff and, and the lady started to throw up. Now I can't do that. I can't, I can't, mm -mm. So the woman was throwing up, crawling around. Pastor Barbara's crawling after her with a bag, catching the stuff. And I'm behind both of them, just dry heaving. I'm, I'm like, ah. Oh. So uh, Pastor Barbara would be, come out in the name of Jesus. You okay? Okay. I'm, and eventually, I just went against the wall and sat and dry heaved. And the lady got free, and I just sat there sick for a while. <laughs> but these, these two people, they're the real thing. And they're, they don't just tell you what Scripture says. They show you. And then they walk with you while you learn it. I, a couple of years ago, um, was told I would die. I didn't have a chance. And they called me in the office and they said, well, we're going, to re we're going to believe the report of the Lord. And that's not it. Pastor Barbara got me into a doctor that it takes months to get into. So within three months, I felt better. Within six months, I was fine. They... They knew I was done. I was weary and tired. And they just stepped in because that's what spiritual parents do. They step in and they hold you up. They fight for you. And good golly, I couldn't love you guys more if I tried. 
And it's okay if you swear. I don't mind. It's all right. Well, you got the best part right there. I told Trisha yesterday we were having something to eat, and I said, I said, I, th I feel like we've been fighting and contending all of this time for this conference. And I know that all of you, in some measure, have been fighting and contending for, for so much, for what God wants to do in you, but even more than that, in the church. Because if he does it in you, he'll do it in us. So, last night I've, I've been uh, I've been pretty tender during this time and 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 pretty emotional. And so I, I went over to Pastor Bill and I and I said during worship I said thank you for doing this. Because I, if there's not somebody to take the mantle, then what happens? Nothing. And for me, the legacy of Bishop Joseph and Pastor Barbara and Covenant Church of Pittsburgh and all that they have contended for and fought for over such a long period of time and continue to stand because you know them. They're people that you can follow because they don't waver. They're not flapping in the wind like the flag. They stand. They stand for what's right and they stand for what they believe. And they stand for reconciliation. They stand for worship. They stand for intercession. They stand for people like they stood for us. We're, we're only here because they stood for us. So I just want to say how grateful I am to both of you. And, and, uh, and even in this time, what you've done is you've, by the decisions you've made, have released so many into their new place and reassignment and opportunity and what God wants to do. You didn't hold back. You released. And so I honor you and thank you for all that you've been to us. Amen. Bishop Gideon. Bishop Gideon Thompson is next to share the remarks. I tell you, Trisha, you could have made a lot of money in stand up. <laughs> More money than working at the church, but we do ask the Lord would bless you and just multiply that in Jesus' name. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. I was being really careful walking up that step so I could just see myself trembling. <laughs> uh, there's an old hymn. One of the verses is, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. T'was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Uh, I met... Uh, Bishop Joseph, actually it was, uh, I didn't actually meet him. I saw him at a charismatic conference. And his ministry was like a light in the midst of darkness. And many of us have been in situations where we're trying to find our way to be used of God more perfectly than we've ever seen ourselves being used. And when you find someone like this man of God, you seek to listen to him and to get into a place where you can learn from many of the journeyings that he has gone through. And um, I was in a hard place after leaving a church and starting all over again with my wife and our children. And um, I got a phone call from Bishop Joseph. I don't think you were bishop then. Pastor Joseph Garlington, and um, we were living uh, there in Dorchester in, in Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, 
He said he was in the area and uh, the plane had been canceled because of bad weather. It's because we live in Massachusetts. You're supposed to laugh on that. <laughs> and, um, and he was looking, wondering, uh, could we hang out with you guys? And of course, uh, we directed him. He, he, he had a, did you have a ride there or did you drive? And, uh, and he came, came to our house. And we had just bought this huge uh, Victorian house. It had radiators, but they didn't heat the first floor. And <laughs> this man of God and his wife, Barbara, sat in our living room that uh, you'd have to really have God to stay alive in there. In the middle of the winter, it was freezing, though we had turned the radiator, um, the uh, thermostat up all the way. But it was, the house wasn't insulated, and we finally got around to doing that. And they sat with us and ministered to us as we were going through an extremely difficult place, trying to get a, 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 a ministry started uh, in a downtown ballroom, uh, hardly anyone was coming but a few people that left the church that I had walked away from because I, I'd taken them literally. I'd taken them as, as far as they would let me. And uh, we, we saw that God was saying, start over and lay a foundation that you can build on. And in the midst of that, Joseph and Barbara Garlington came and spent several hours with us um, sitting in our living room. I think we threw them some blankets. And, um, <laughs> and uh, they literally ministered to us in a dark place and light shining through them and through their words of experience gave us a hope that we did not have. And when they left the next day, took off for Pittsburgh, I thought, could it be that I've met something that I've been praying for? I got saved in the Church of God in 1964, and the, my, my pastor didn't believe in bishops, but I thought, Lord, could this man be like a bishop in my life? And eventually we connected. I started coming to presence and the rest is history. This man became a father to me and I've at times called him dad. But the thing that is so powerful is that he's speaking, you know, he spoke to me. I don't know altogether how he spoke to you in your conditions, but to me, he said a word that I desperately needed to hear. And out of the experience of coming to presence, out of the experience of, of sharing um, in the church here, out of the experience of our fellowship over the past 20 to 30 years, God has moved in such a powerful way that literally, by the grace of God, my wife and I pastored, uh, I'm retired now, but five years ago, but my wife and I pastored the largest church. And every year, Bishop Joseph would come at our conference, and we saw God move in such a powerful way with him, through him, through his ministry to, to me, his ministry to our church, that I can honestly say, I pastored a large, I pastored to the grace, by the grace of God, I pastored the largest church in all of New England. One year, I asked my executive assistant to tell me how many people have given to our ministry. And don't count the ones that didn't give at least $100. Don't count them. But just count the ones that have given at least $100 in this past year. And that that figure was over $15,000 as individuals. Uh, 15,000 people that had given 
at least a hundred dollars and the ministry has grown and uh, to God be the glory but you know you don't do it by yourself of course God is the one that's guiding and directing but by the grace of God he sends you help and I, I love you Bishop and I'm glad I'm in your life and you're in mine Pastor Gil Duncan the fourth, please. After that will be Pastor Steve Witt. Thank you, Bishop Gideon. Good to see you, sir. Thank you so much, Pastor Absolutely. Bill, and congratulations Thank you. on being the new pastor here at Covenant Church of Pittsburgh. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. First of all, Bishop, thank you so much for inviting me to come and have some words on this very special night. And I've been over the probably the last 48 hours trying to think about what I would say and it's so hard to capture everything. But as you and Pastor Barbara transition, I want to say some things that hopefully you'll carry with you in your memory bank as memories of encouragement. It was 1971 when Bishop, when you came to Pittsburgh, back then we knew you as Elder Garlington. And I know at that time we were at the right church at the right time because you came as the revivalists. You came once and ran the revival and then you came back again. And if I can compare your coming and Pastor Barbara coming to Pittsburgh at that time, if I can use an analogy, it would be this. When people find themselves in a very desperate place of life or death, they will pick up the phone and dial 911 and hope that medical emergency can get there as soon as possible. Well, at that time, there were some people in this city and my parents were among them who loved the Lord, they were saved, they were living for God, but they were saying, Lord, there's got to be more. We love you, we, we thank God for our church, but there's got to be more. Well, in 1971, the more came to Pittsburgh. And at the time, we didn't know just how great God was going to use the more, but the more came and you began to minister in a way that answered the prayer of the people, my parents included. And they were saying, Lord, that's the more. Now, when you when you came the second time to our church, you preached a message called he's all together lovely. And. As a child, I remember just getting up the next day and all I kept hearing was the man of God said, he's all together lovely. He's all, and they kept saying it over and over again. And so you could begin to see the watering of the people. They were getting water. People who had been dry and so thirsty, they were getting water. And it was an unusual move of God because at that time, uh, when the shift began to, to occur, and that's the thing, when you and Pastor Barbara came, it was a literal shift. There was a shifting in the city. I know we use that terminology a lot. Oh, God is shifting. That was a shift that I believe this city is still feeling the effects of. But there was a shift. And even as a child, I remember seeing the change that was occurring among the people because one of the things that you did you showed the people how you showed the people how easy it was to get saved 
how easy it was to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, there are some people who criticize that and they fought you for that. But you were running these revivals in different parts of the city. One of the biggest ones was at the Homewood Public Library. And you preached every night for a whole week and people were being filled with the Holy Spirit. You ran a revival up on Bryn Mawr Road with Bishop Jones, Great Emmanuel, and people were getting saved and filled with the Spirit. And out of that move, you and Pastor Barbara knew it was time for us to start our ministry. And here I was as an eight-year-old child watching the beginning of this ministry start. I remember... Bishop, you would even you were teaching the adults. Sometimes it would be it would start like maybe at 730 at night and Bishop would literally preach to 1130 at night, like nonstop. And we would be outside playing and just waiting for it to be over. <laughs> In fact, one night it was so long, one of my uncles had to get some crackers and peanut butter and some water and come out and give us something to eat. But. But that happened for a very long time because the people, it's like you were sensitive to just how hungry and thirsty the people were. And you would do that, it would be night after night. And, and of course, out of that, the church began to come together. And I, I thought, particularly, I thought it was very exciting to go church hunting, looking for a building, because we were in the homes, worshiping in the homes. The neighbors didn't know what was going on. What is going on? These cars lined up on the street, all these people. But we were looking for a church and then finally it, it landed us in um, Knoxville. Maranatha Gospel Tabernacle. That was our first building on Charles Street in Knoxville. But Bishop and Pastor Barbara, as you transition, please understand because of you, Lives changed and families changed forever. There are some people who come into, and you all know how this is. There are some people who come into your life and you can say with all honesty, if they had not come in my life, my life would not be the same. I would not be where I am today. And that's the kind of people you all are. Critical moments where we needed pastors just like you the enemy had been trying to kill me from infancy trying to take me out one way or another February of 1972 Sunday morning it was the day before Valentine's Day and Services that particular Sunday were being held at the home of my Aunt Ruby and Uncle Jack in Penn Hills. And uh, so my grandmother and I had, had, we got a ride from my Uncle Bubba and Aunt Jerry headed to Penn Hills from the north side. And we were on Route 28. And on our way to church, a car rammed right into my uncle's vehicle. And I was the only one who was seriously injured. And the call came to my aunt's house. <clears throat> and at that time, Bishop had been teaching a message called the sacrifice of praise. And Bishop, you got in the car with my mother and father and drove to Allegheny General Hospital. And my parents didn't know if I was dead or alive. Back then, there wasn't 911, and, and uh, one of my uncles just picked me up in his arms and just started running with me. And thanks be to God, there was a family that stopped and drove us down to that hospital. But they tell me that I literally died. Blood was everywhere. But you all came, and on the way to the hospital, you supported my mother and father, and all all the way to the hospital, you worshiped. You worshiped. You put into practice the sacrifice of praise. And my father walked into the room where I was laying on the table with bandages all around my head. And I believe my dad prophesied for the first time. 
And my father's first words were, what good thing has God done today? He said, God's going to raise him up in three days. I wasn't out of that hospital in three days, but I was out of intensive care in three days. But it was the teaching of the sacrifice of praise that got my mother and father through a very difficult day. And my parents tell me that they never cried. They never wept in that experience. It was because of that teaching and that example. So thank you. And on behalf of that whole generation, wherever they are, whether they've gone to heaven or live in different parts of the country, thank you. Thank you for all your investment. Thank you for your love. And thank you for your pastoral care. God bless you. Pastor Steve Witt, and then in conclusion, uh, Pastor David Kitely. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Hey, I like those pictures of your hair, Bill. That was beautiful. <laughs> I'm Steve Witt. I'm from Bethel, Cleveland, Ohio, home of the Cleveland Browns. Twenty twenty two world champions. <laughs> Speaking those things which are not. So they were. Hey, I'll make this really quick, I think. But uh, Bishop, Barbara, you've meant so much to me. I mean, I've told you personally so many times, but so that everyone can hear. I mean, I, I was always intrigued by uh, Joseph Garlington. And, when uh, you know, the Promise Keeper days and even further back than that. And uh, always kind of watched him at afar because I didn't really know him. But I thought, man, I want to, I want to meet that guy someday. He's got, he's got some juice in him, you know. He's really, he's a, he's kind of a singer and preacher and actor and he, a comedian and powerful anointed preacher and I mean, it was, just, it was like a, an amazing mix, you know. So I, first, I finally got a chance to come over to a conference in I think it was '96 or it was probably '96 I think uh, up at the hotel there. I forget where it was. Holiday Inn, maybe. And I, I came in late, and Bishop Garlington uh, was, was up on the stage, laying on his back, with his feet up in the air, and he had just thrown his shoes and socks off. Do you remember that? You, do, you probably didn't want me to remember that, but <laughs> he was spinning around a circle and kind of, you just yelling out, you know, and I thought, that's a man I can follow right there, right? I like that. And so uh, got to be friends. He invited me over for actually monthly for a couple years to train in the prophetic and we got to know each other. And just such a, I, 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 this is kind of my Pittsburgh home. And if you're from this area, you know, Pittsburgh and Cleveland has some issues that need to be dealt with <laughs> and have been dealt with over the years from this side. And uh uh, I, I, Bishop came over to Cleveland one time and in front of a big crowd, he presented me a t-shirt with me and Bill Cower, and I, he, we had our arms around one another. <laughs> you remember that? Yes. <laughs> you remember that? I think I still have it. And, uh, you know, we've had this great time of just connecting and having fun between the two uh, churches here. And actually, when I came over here in 96, I was just starting the church in Cleveland. And when he invited me to come over every month, what it did for me, he may not even know this, but it forced me to, to kind of build a course, you know, on the prophetic, because I had to get something every month to come over to Pittsburgh. And I, it was an amazing shaping and launching time and just getting to hang with them. I learned things from Pastor Barbara, like how to do the electric slide she showed me. I did it once, I think, you know, that just wasn't my gift, but she tried. She tried right up here. And, uh, 
And I remember Bishop teaching me about racial issues. We were in a restaurant and uh, we were sitting there with a bunch of other people. And he, I, I really hadn't known him that long. And he said, hey, he said, it's a little chilly in here. Do you mind, would you go over to the thermostat and just adjust it? We're in a restaurant. Go to the thermostat and just adjust the thermostat. And I, he's Bishop, so I, I did it. And I... <laughs> I went over there to adjust the thermostat and I heard the manager say, excuse me, sir. He said, are you feeling a little too chilly? And I said, yes, I, I am. He said, well, let me adjust it for you. And I went back over and sat down. He said, now, do you know why I did that, right? I said, no. And he said, well, if I'd have gone over there, he'd say, hey, what are you doing? He said, what with you? He said, let me just adjust the thermostat. So I, I said, okay, I think I, I'm learning. I'm learning, you know. And uh, I've watched him over the years. He has shaped probably more than anyone else that I can think of my preaching, my communication up front. Uh, I just, uh, you know, in fact, I wrote it down because I want to make sure I got it right here. But I, I just want to tell you, you guys in many ways are spiritual parents to me that I've really just gleaned from what Cindy and I both over the years. We've been through so many things together. You've shown me, Bishop, Barbara, both great favor on so many levels. I mean, I, I could recount them, but it would take a while. And I, I just appreciate it. You're a great teacher. You're, you uh, have been the most accessible of, of, in my life, of some of the great apostles that have emerged in this generation. I mean, uh, could call you anytime, chat with you, talk with you. And you just really treated me like a spiritual son, both of you. And um, I appreciate your stunning ability to read the room and custom fit a message that ends up repeating in my mind over and over again for years to come. I mean, I still, I mean, we get in a situation, even my kids who grew up hearing him over in Cleveland, we'll get to a situation and they'll go, no limits, no boundaries. <laughs> and we all sing it together, you know, it's a family anthem. So I love you guys, I really do, I love you. And you've been steadfast. And I know sometimes that feels like, that's not a very exciting term, but, but you know, you being steadfast all the year, these years have really encouraged, I believe, thousands of ministers around the world. And you honor the prophetic like, like a child. And you follow the, the prophetic path, even though it takes you places where you're going faith to faith and glory to glory. And it's, what, what do you say? It's hell in the hallways sometimes. And uh, I've found that to be true. So I adore you guys. I emulate you. I honor you tonight. And I believe that both of you in this, this reassignment, is it a reassignment? Reassignment. I need one of those. <laughs> you're you're going to discover a treasure trove of goodness that needs a bow put on it. I feel like you're in a season of life, you're going to go around putting bows on things. Like it's going to be a finishing touch. And a lot of it's going to be things that you started and maybe even handed off to others or whatever. And you're going to have the privilege of going around and just kind of tying these things up, tying them up and continuing to release who Jesus is in you and I just pray that the Spirit of God on both of you will continue in healing and strength and might all the days of your life. I was coming over here today. I just got back from, I was in Montana this morning. And I, I, uh, I was just thinking about it after Bill called me. And I just thought, I, I believe we're going to see your 90th birthdays and your 100th birthday. Yeah. And... And when maybe we're going to have some kind of celebration like this. I just hope I can make it that long to come to the celebration. But, but if we're going to have a celebration, I just want to honor you and thank you for being such dear spiritual parents to so many people, particularly me. God bless. It's been a great week, hasn't it, already? 
presence of God has been here in a wonderful way. And uh, we're just so happy to be here to honor your bishop and pastor. They've meant so much in our lives. I just like to, as I start my remarks, just to ask everybody from Covenant Church to stand, first of all. If you've been here any time over the years and you've been part of this church, I just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being so generous to release these servants of God, not only in this local area, but also you know, as they have traveled across this nation and around the world, you'll never know throughout all eternity how many people's lives have been changed and uh, have been altered at the altar. God bless you. Be seated. Thank you. And that certainly is our testimony as well. You know, in Acts, the 20th chapter, Apostle Paul talked to the church of Ephesus and he was speaking to the elders. He said, I was with you in all seasons. I was with you in times of joy. I was with you in times of sorrow. I was there for you. Isn't it wonderful to know when somebody is there for you and they really care and they're not just there performing, but they're authentic and they're real? One thing about the bishop that is very true, he knows how to keep it real. And just when you want to get religious and you want to get far out there, he'll rein you in, take you off guard. You know, the Lord has used him to touch our lives and our family in some major ways. I remember when Pastor Barbara and Bishop came, they were back east somewhere ministering, and they heard about our family. We were in real need. My daughter had had three miscarriages, lost one baby, and she's getting ready to lose another one. And incidentally, that one has been raised up to be a missionary this week, and he's going forth to, uh, as a missionary. But they got in a plane and flew all the way across the country, not to minister, not to preach, but just to come into our living room and pray and minister to our family and strengthen us. People just don't do that. That just doesn't happen. And uh, we didn't even know how to respond to it other than to say, this is the grace of God. He sent some angels among us. And I think that restored life and restored hope in my my. Uh, daughter and she just uh, has blossomed from that time and she's in ministry full time now so amen God is good and I want to say that uh, five generations of our family have been touched by the Garlingtons my grandfather 105 my mother late Violet Violet Kitely she preached many times here and prophesied and they always said about my mother the violent she'll take it by force and, but uh, then there's my wife and myself. I want my wife to stand. We're in our 56th year of marriage. And then my son, Patrick, and I mentioned my daughter and our grandkids who are moving into ministry as well. Five generations have been touched by this family. I think that's a record. Amen. And we, have, we thank God and we appreciate what he's done. Some of the areas that have always impressed, impressed me about them was their ability to remain stable and firm in the worst of times. And I've seen them go through some very difficult situations and come out of it stronger than ever. And it wasn't putting on any, they were hurting, but uh, they didn't have to put on a display or look for self-pity, but they were willing to be open and be transparent, and they showed people how to grieve. They showed how to people to go through sorrow and still be overcomers, and that's powerful when you have that kind of a ability in God and anointing to be able to do that. Another thing was already mentioned was their love for the prophetic. This house is a prophetic house, apostolic house. And I don't know any church in America today that loves the prophetic more than this house. They will not move on any direction without the prophetic. Hearing from God is not an option. But this house has been directed for so many years by the prophetic. And God has touched this place. And he's touching the world through this place and continues to do that. Amen? Also, just 
being faithful to the original vision. You know, people can alter their vision in an age when they say everything is evolving and truth doesn't mean the same as it does and the terminology is changed and we got it the words don't mean the same how many know that God's word remains the same and these people remain the same and the vision that they had they're just as excited about it today as they were the day they started in the very beginning of their time amen in fact I think they're more excited about it as they're going into this new phase of life the ability to stay stable makes you fruitful they have been fruitful they have multiplied you know the old movie it's a wonderful life how many are old enough to have seen that <laughs> George Bailey what did they say about him what is the final thing they said what would there what would the world be like or what would have been like if there had never been a George Bailey and I say what would the world been like what would Pittsburgh been like if there never been Bishop Garlington and Sister Barbara God bless you all right it's offering time yes that wasn't good enough. Let's say it's offering time. Yeah. Wow, this conference, you know, I, I, this is my session that I came to. This was it. I, you know, it was late, but I, I talked to Bill earlier. I heard it's been a great time of just being together and the speakers and the ministry and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I know that you've given a lot of money toward this conference and, you know, really helped in bringing, making this, you know, this whole thing that's going on, this this reassignment. I just want you to know that that's been a challenge across this country right now. I read the other day that 51% of ministers are in some kind of transition right now uh, as far as the structure and leadership of the church. It's a, it's a big deal. And th this feels like the oil of the Holy Spirit is upon this. May this be an example to many pastors around the country and encourage them that it is possible to do this. And so here we are at this conference, and we're celebrating really the bringing in of the new and the introducing and realignment of those who have been here, pioneers in this area. I think it's an amazing thing. We're a little short on our budget here at this conference. It's right around $20,000. So we need, we need a supernatural offering right now. How many of you know that God does that? He really does. He loves generosity. Here's what came to me. Bill called me a little while ago, and I was, I, you know, I've, I've been out of it for a week here. But immediately, the Holy Spirit gave me this verse that does not sound like an offering verse. So give me just a minute to explain it, and then we're going to take up, uh, take up the offering here for the conference so that we can make sure we cover all of our bills here. In John 19, it says this. Jesus said, he, remember, he's hanging on a cross now. On the cross, he says this. When Jesus therefore, therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which was John, standing by, he said to his mother, of course you wouldn't say this today, but he did then, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, now he's got nails in his hands, hanging on a cross, and he's saying, he said, woman, behold your son. He says to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his home. Now, the reason it's interesting to me, I've been meditating on this for about three months, this passage. And it, so it came right to me, and I thought, well, what does that got to do with the offering? But I realized the presence of Christ, that in the moment he was in, he was giving and he was resolving circumstances right in front of him, knowing that his mom would be left relatively alone because his father, had, we're not sure what happened. He died, something happened. And she'd be alone. He being the oldest son would be the one to take over, but he's leaving. And he turns to John. He could have turned to a bunch of different people, their relatives, legally. But he turns to John. Some people think John may have been a cousin of Jesus. He was young. And then John, it turns out if you study history, church history, and it's kind of fascinating, 
and Mark, you can correct me on this later, but it's fascinating that they believe that John built her a house near Ephesus. In fact, the Catholic Church recognized that about, what, 15 years ago. It wasn't that long. You can actually go there and see the stone house that he built her. And it was within shouting distance, kind of. I mean, you could almost, it was up on a hill outside of Ephesus. You could almost see Patmos where John went for a while. They tried to kill him and they couldn't kill him. But John, Jesus was arranging circumstances while on the cross. And I thought, that's Jesus. He, he had a sense of presence of what was going on around him. When his mother came in and said, we're out of wine, he sensed the presence of the moment. And even though he kind of pushed back a little bit, when she left and she said, do whatever he tells you to do, that's a Jewish way of saying, Jesus, you're going to do what I just said. And he did. And he did. And what a wonderful first miracle it was, you know. And so you look at that. You look at when he sees the multitude and they're hungry, he has compassion upon them. And so I, thought, I was thinking about that, and I thought, that's, that's really a spirit of giving, where you're able to be in an environment and assess the environment, even if you feel like you're on a cross, and say, wait, we need to fix this. We need to straighten this out. We need to get you with you so that I know she's taken care of. This thing will work before I, before I pass away. And right now today, we know the environment we're in right now. I mean, there's a presence here of, of transition. And by the way, that presence of transition might even be like a template on your life right now. You know, you're somewhere, and I'm not talking about you're leaving and going somewhere, but just something of a shift in your life where you realize, I feel something fresh coming in. I feel a reassignment, a reassignment in what I'm doing and a deeper assignment or a, or a higher assignment, whatever it might be. And the best thing to do in that moment is to work out, recognize the presence we're in, and sow into that. Multiply loaves and fishes. Turn water into wine. I mean, Abraham of old, he recognized when the angels came to him, he thought, wow, I think something's going on here. And so he runs in, he and Sarah, and they prepare this meal, they come out and they feed them. And out of that comes an amazing word that comes out of those angels toward him about his future, prophetic understanding. There's just something about recognizing the moment we're in right now. It is a Jesus thing to do that. And by doing that, you serve and give into the kingdom of God. So right now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to recognize this moment. Let's all stand together if we could. Recognizing the moment we're in, regardless of our circumstances. And we're going to sow into it. We're going to sow a solution. And right now, that solution looks like somewhere around twenty to $25,000 for this conference. And so that's going to take some of us really giving Many of us giving something, others giving a lot of somethings. And I think we have a, do we have a way up here to give? Yeah. So you can text to give over here, give to CCOP. It shows the numbers. If you can't read that, oh, now you can. 73256. See how I just spoke and it enlarged right there. <laughs> Online, CCOP, you can do that right now or do it when you get home. We prefer right now because it helps us with uh, how we finish off things here at the conference. Or you can mail that in, snail mail, and get it to us in Pittsburgh right there. And uh, let's see the Lord just blow this thing out. I mean, let's, let's go to it and beyond it. And uh, see the, the Lord just kind of tie a bow on what we're doing right here. So hold out your gift, even if you're going to do it on your phone or out of your wallet or whatever. I think we have envelopes nearby too um, that we can uh, just sow this. So we, we hold this out, Lord, right now. We sow this, we recognize this is a holy moment. <laughs> recognize, Lord, this reassignment is something amazing, and it's, and it's kind of rare. And so, Lord, in this reassignment right now, we, like Jesus, speak into it. We resolve situations. We resolve conflicts. We resolve shortages out of this moment. And, Lord, we rise up as the people of God, and we sow into CCOP, in this conference right now, 
to seal the deal, close this season. As we look at the future and other presence conferences that will come, we'll say what a glorious time that was in that transition. God supplied for all of our needs and more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Bill. Well, good evening. I'm Pastor George Furlow, the music pastor here. It's great to see everybody tonight. And uh, we have a really special surprise for you tonight. Uh, if you would put that scripture up on the... Uh, this is a little pattern of worship that Bishop has taught us. You know, he's great for patterns. Kneeling, raising your hands, biblical patterns. Well, listen to this pattern. Then, from Nehemiah 12, 31. Then I heard the leaders of Judah come up on the top of the wall, and I pointed two choirs. The first proceeding to the right on the top and the wall toward the refuse gate. And the other scripture is, Chenaniah, chief of the Levites, was in charge of the singing. Well, we have a Chenaniah here. His name is Kenny. Kenny Wilder from uh, Oasis Church. <clears throat> These two choirs are made up of Covenant Church.
Yeah. So good. So good. Thank you, Jesus. You can have a seat. Wow. The Mass Choir from Covenant Church of Pittsburgh and Oasis City Church in Columbus. Thank you, Minister Ken Wilder, for leading us and making... I mean, they were practicing virtually, making parts on uh, uh, MP3s, sending things, trying to do two different rehearsals, and everybody got together tonight for a rehearsal, and they did that. Thank you, Pastor George Furlow, Alton Merrill, and Clarence Grant for co-MDing. Uh, so good. I'm also buying Bishop a restroom break, so I'm just a few minutes. <laughs> Why does Pastor Bill keep talking? Well, there's, there's always behind the scenes information. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, thank you, choir. Yeah, that was, that was good. I, trust me, I'm fine with the microphone. So, um, no, we're, we're, we're moving into a, a time where we're going to receive ministry from uh, Dr. Mark Sharona, which is going to be amazing. Um, and, and just before that, we have one piece that we want to um, incorporate into the ministry time. And we realize that this, this is an interesting weekend and we do celebrate it. Um, I want to just make something real plain and clear. Uh, I receive the fact and I accept the fact that I am Bishop Garlington's successor, but I am not his replacement. And I say that from me first. So don't look at me that way, but don't look at him that way either. Uh, there is actually nobody that can replace the ministry of Bishop Joseph Garlington. And so, he, you know, he's like a comet. You know, you, you see him once every 80 years or something like that. And there's no way you, you just don't get too close because you can't try to replicate it. And so Bishop being reassigned, you know, we get that question a lot. What does that mean? And, and uh, me and Lynn and Bishop and Nana, we, we have sat for months and months. We've been talking and praying and seeking God for well over a year and a half. But even, you know, just, you know, almost two years, but a year and a half of really talking about this, praying it through, talking to prophets, receiving words of God, trying to figure things out, trying to say, what does this look like? And although we don't have all the answers, I, I want you to recognize that we all need Bishop Garlington in our lives. We all need uh, Pastor Barbara in our lives, and we want that. And so, Bishop's voice at Covenant is still going to be heard. He will still be on this platform. He will still be ministering uh, as the schedule allows. He'll still be at conferences. I will still be learning from him not only as, as a father, but also as a mentor and as the bishop of, of this church and also our Reconciliation Ministries uh, network. There is a wonderful opportunity uh, for he and Barbara to be able to travel to churches in our network that just haven't been able to host him because of his schedule, uh, because of his international schedule, like uh, uh, Pastor David talked about. Thank you, Covenant, for letting him do all of this all these years. So there, there are many people out there that, that need his voice, that need a visit, that need that touch, and he's going to be able to be released and reassigned to have a voice here, but also continue to touch the nations and continue to touch our churches that are represented here. So if I were you, I'd get him booked immediately because that schedule is going to ramp up. But, we, but I, I want you to know that, that we're working through this and, and his value is increasing, not decreasing. Pastor Barbara's value is increasing, not decreasing. And we're all going to learn more, and we're all going to do this together because we're, we're all part of this family. So thank you for being part of tonight. Uh, would Apostle Leif, would you come forward, please? Bishop Joseph and Pastor Barbara, would you come forward as well.
It is a great honor for me to be able to present uh, a rod that has been custom made for this occasion. And anyone that was here last night, we recognize that uh, Bishop uh, Joseph Garlington and uh, Pastor Barbara, they handled the mantle and also the new mandate to the next generation. But we also believe that as, uh, as Bishop also have laid on a rod, God has also given him a new rod for this new season. And we just, uh, and on this rod, uh, uh, we made it is custom made where it is carved in gold. And uh, the scripture verse is Matthew 6, 33, which says, and I just felt that you have been seeking first his kingdom. And you have always seek first his righteousness. And as a result, all these things shall be added unto you. And then I heard another word, and we didn't have room on the staff, but it says, as you have delighted yourself in me, I'm going to give you the desire of your heart. And I just felt there was a season. You have been dreaming with Papa God, but in this season, Papa God wants to dream with you. And it is called desire. And I just was seeing both of you sitting, and you were writing your desire list in this season. Because as you have delighted yourself in Him, He will give you the desire of your heart. So in behalf of our kingdom family movement, we want to give you a rod. And you can take this apart. We have a nice little bag. You can put it in your suitcase. But I also saw you with churches and ministry and cities. You were holding up the rod of God over city. And there was this unity and the atmosphere was changing. And I think there is a connection to some of the things that God wants to do in the new season. And the second picture I saw also, individuals was like the rod of God. And I saw all these lives that lay down their life. And all the hiss went out and all of his came in. And then there was all these lives that was in the hands of God that he was holding up and the environment was changing. So I just wanted to give you this gift and I would like Pastor Bill and Lynn just to come and also now to release a blessing over you. <laughs> well, I'm not going to cry because I do that easily when thinking of these moments. But Father, I'm privileged just to bless our daddy. And Lord, I just ask that you would provide the Father's blessing upon his life and ministry. And this reassignment would actually be the most glorious time of his life. The Father, that he would see you in a new way, and each and every morning, he would feel your smile upon his life and his ministry. That he would see the effectiveness, that he would look back at his legacy, but he would also look forward prophetically and see all the things that you have for him. So I ask that his eyes would be opened to another level. I ask that his spiritual ears would be opened to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. I thank you that he's one whose head is always below his heart. His heart is always above his head as he bows in worship. And Father, as he does that, pray you continue to meet him and bless him. Give him the desires of his heart. And all the things that he knows is unfinished business. I thank you, Lord, that he will, he will live a long, healthy, strong life. And as Prophet Steve said, that he would be tying bows on, on presents and on things that he's given to the world. So I bless him now, and we bless him as a church family in the name of Jesus. And I speak over Pastor Barbara, words of love and honor and pride in being your daughter. In my darkest times, it was your words that made me get out of bed in the morning. It was things that you said to me that made me want to go further. And I know the words that you've spoken over my life that helped heal my heart are words that you're going to still be speaking over other women in our network and people all over the world. Your voice is needed. Your love is needed. You'll always be honored and respected. 
because you're a woman after God's own heart and your words are powerful and anointed. And I just thank you, Lord, for all that she's been in my life, in my children's life, in my church family's life. And I thank you, Lord, that you're going to do so much more. And unlike Bill, I'm not a crier, so this is. So, Father God, I just thank you that you put this powerful woman in my life. And I choose to glean from her all through my ministry because I know that she is someone that you've given to me. And I release her to be that same to others. I won't be stingy, (laughs) even though I would like to be, because I know her work is not done and her voice needs to be heard. And the healing anointing that flows through her hands needs to be touched because people need her. So I thank you, Lord. I bless her. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We've all also have learned over the years, the many years of Covenant Church family and history uh, through the ministry of Bishop Mark Sharona and really a man that needs no introduction to this house. And we do want to receive all that the Lord has spoken to him to minister this week. I know he's prepared and he's been praying about this very moment. And there's no other person really on the planet that we would want to be a part of this. And I know that Bishop would want to to navigate us through the ministry of this evening. So would you please welcome Dr. Mark Sharonan. the Lord. It is an honor and a delight to be here tonight and to share with all the festivities that have gone on, um, to listen to all the stories, all the memories, all the testimonies. And I don't take it lightly that Bishop and Pastor Barbara asked me to share. Um, I, I find myself always wrestling when I stand behind this pulpit. Partly because when I was here and I stood behind the sacred desk in the 80s, Bishop had a pair of bifocals. And any time I would say anything that got his attention that he might have questioned, the bifocals went down. And I knew it would be followed by a meeting in his office back in the old building. And he would say things like, you can't do that with the scripture. Only 10 years later, he started doing the same stuff I was doing. <laughs> and uh, so impartation works both ways. I gave Bishop all his gray hairs. I'm the only one that can take credit for that. And, um, but I I am especially, you know, feeling anxious tonight. So I called Vinny, and he gave me a piece of one of the things in his stash that keeps you calm. And I find it a very present help in the midst of trouble. I won't tell you what it is, but it really does work. And Vinny has a collection, and so if you need some, just see him after the service is over. Uh, 
I want to share with us from a particular portion of Scripture in John's Gospel and then endeavor to tie it in with a passage, a story that doesn't necessarily look like it relates, and I'll do my best to do that. But it's going to take me about 15 minutes to take you through certain things that I think I need to preframe and establish from a scriptural perspective in order to argue for what I want to argue for as it relates to this historic moment. I want to read to you from John's Gospel, chapter 16, beginning at verse 4, going through verse 7. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. However, I did not say these things to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, grief has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, that it is to your advantage that I am leaving, for if I do not leave, the helper, more literally the paraclete, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I want to speak to you tonight from the theme, it is to your advantage. It is to your advantage. And I'm not just speaking to Covenant Church. I'm not just speaking to Oasis Church. I'm not just speaking to the Reconciliation Network. I'm speaking to the entire movement. Life tends to move from simplicity to complexity. And we find ourselves as we grow in the seasons of life that there's a lot more that goes on in those chapters of our journey that reshape our understanding of our calling. Animals have no ability to self-reflect. They can abstract out to a certain degree. You can teach a dog to fetch a bone. You can even teach a dog to get your slippers. You can teach a dog to know where their plate is, where they're going to eat. But a dog is instinctual. A dog cannot reflect back on why they need to eat or why they are getting you there your slippers, or those kind of things. But human beings are the only species that God created that have several, several levels of a capacity to self-reflect. And a calling that is from God, and all of us are called, is something that when we are apprehended by the hand of providence, How we understand that and our reflections initially change as we move through the chapters of life. When Jeremiah tells us that God called him as a youth, he is not a youth when he's telling us that story. Jeremiah has already been decades in the work of prophetic utterance and prophetic ministry to the nation of Israel when he says... I was a young boy when God called me, and the reason he can't talk about it at 16 years old is that he doesn't even understand what the call is except to say yes. And it's not until he walks through the various dynamics of his life that he can even look back and understand what his history was telling him. While things are happening within the present moment, we don't understand them, even when we're obedient. It is only in the seasoning of God as you move forward through several layers and levels of self-reflection that you come to realize, oh, that's what God was doing. That's what God was working out. It is not while you're going through that you have insight. 
Insight does not come until you have had enough hindsight to understand what you come to as insight. And without hindsight, you can't be a prophet. We tend to think that prophecy is about predicting the future, but you cannot predict the future. I don't want to go there because I'll, that'll take an hour just to talk about why prophets didn't predict the future. Prophets promise a future. What good is it for Isaiah to say, a virgin shall conceive, if Mary doesn't say, be it unto me, according to your word. The prophet stands in an eternal dimension apprehended by God to understand the arc of history and look at the behaviors that have gone on up until the moment that the prophet is uttering what is being uttered and understands the things which were have determined the things which are, and if they continue in that way, these are the things that shall be. So it is not so much about what hasn't happened as much as it is about what has already happened. And therefore, when we talk about spiritual formation, that doesn't happen by a download. That happens by wrestling with the God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God doesn't download to human beings. Computers are downloaded by programmers, but you were made with a mind that has perception, cognition, intuition, memory, volition, reflection, that God does not download there. God who lives inside you, the same way a hand fits in a glove, moves through your unique personality, allows you to get hunches and hints and nudges from here or there from the depths of your being, but allows you to clothe that awareness with the way you reflect. And you don't owe Always get it right until you go through the wrestlings that perfect you. So there ought to be a level of authority with which you speak the longer you live and the longer you reflect and the longer you wrestle that when you speak there is a weightiness that says this person has a history with the triune God. And there's a world of difference between someone that has a talent and someone that has a relationship. Now, I just read you the story of Jesus on the night of his passion getting ready to cross the Kidron Valley to experience the fullness of our alienation from God, our alienation from ourselves, our alienation from others, our alienation from creation, and our alienation from our purpose. I remember in the early days of my journey with Jesus, they told me sin separates us from God. That's only one-fifth true. Sin doesn't just separate you from God. Sin is not only alienation from God, it is alienation from yourself. And it's not only alienation from yourself, it is alienation from others. It is not only alienation from others, it is alienation from your purpose. And it is not only alienation from your purpose, it is alienation from creation itself. You say, where do you get that from? We go back and read the story in Genesis 3. All five separations took place when they chose to eat independently of God to decide what's good and evil. And they compromised their ability at self-reflection and created something by their choices that brought evil into the human race. And evil is the corruption of good. God is not the author of evil. And so it took thousands of years for God to bring forth 
born of a woman, his only begotten son. The only difference between Jesus and you and I is that he is eternally begotten of the Father. And so when you read passages like this about Jesus, where he says, I'm going away, where can God go? Have you ever noticed when you're trying to obey God and God says, I'm sending you somewhere, by the time you get there, he's already ahead of you? And God, who is not bound, though happens to time, because the incarnation happened to time. The incarnation didn't just happen time and space-wise. God happens to everything. Nothing happens to God. God happened to you. And when God happened to you and you were aware of it, you said yes. He says this in John 14, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear much fruit. Now, in relationship to the Godhead, the father is the royal monarch. But he doesn't have in that royal monarchy a greater sense of godhood than the Son or the Spirit. The Father, Son, and Spirit are co-eternal, co-substantial, and are all God. They don't, it's not one God that wears three masks, and it's not three gods. It is one God in three unique persons, but even the term person in the 20th and 21st century doesn't even match what the early fathers were trying to tell us about who God was. Sadly, in our Pentecostal history, when the issues of trying to figure out how to interpret these passages touched the Pentecostal movement, there was division between those that saw the oneness and those that saw the threeness. And I would prophesy to you that there needs to be a healing of that division because we never should have separated. But it does mean that all of us need to go back to school and find out what is this all about. It is not the triune God that is the mystery. It is that God's not like us that's the mystery. Jesus teaches us about the threeness and how they mutually indwell one another and how they function. The Son is generated eternally from the Father. The Father isn't the Father because you're all his kids. The Father is uniquely the Father because he has only one unique Son. The Son is only the Son because he is the Son of the one Father who we call God. David and Nicole sang to us tonight, Holy, holy, holy. The ancient church prayed it this way. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal. To describe the uniquenesses of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I would suggest to you that the threeness and the oneness don't show up in Mary's womb to teach us. It is present from the beginning. And I don't want to blow your mind but if you've never seen Back to the Future and understood how time can be bent from a place outside of time, you will never understand how Jesus could be the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. So who is it that shows up at Abraham's tent? This is not some amorphous ghost. This is an embodied individual who outside of time can break into time because of the resurrection. And happen to the past without you even missing a beat. Oh, 
But we don't want to talk about this stuff. But this is where the deep stuff gets. If we really got into this stuff, we would take worship to another level. But why am I talking about this? What has this got to do with where we're all going and where Bishop and Pastor Barbara are going? God's not going anywhere. Neither are they. So I want to read you some notes that I want you to just grasp, and then I'm going to preach to you for a few minutes. John's gospel is written from a prophetic perspective in relation to the mystical reality of Christ himself. It's written to a church in transition and persecution. John knows that what Jesus spoke on that night of his passion in the upper room has import for the hour in his life in which he, John, has arrived. Those words Jesus spoke were spoken in relation to change, transition, and tribulation. For us now, where are we in the arc of history? Whether you like it or not, COVID has pressed a reset button. COVID changed the world in, is, in just one simple felt swoop. And we are just beginning to realize what that is. And we're all addicted to wanting to go back to normal. There is no going back. There is only going forward. COVID has delivered us from any illusions about control and about who is sovereign. And it isn't us. It's the spirit. Can't blow COVID away. And call it faith. You can blow it away and claim you're prophesying, but you're prophesying. You neither know the scripture, nor do you know the power of God, because you reduced calling those things that are not as though they are, and turned it into a way that you can control God. Repent. Don't worry, it gets better. John's gospel is written when all the living apostolic witnesses, who were the link in the chain, between Jesus and the church, we're gone. John is the last living witness and is summing up his life and preparing them for moving on beyond his own presence as being something to rely on for the time he's gone. In the summing up of John's life, he doesn't realize it, but he's going to be committed to teaching and writing. And he's going to give us two, gospel, two, 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 two tomes. First, he's going to give us a prophetic awareness that will become the last book of the Bible called the Apocalypse of Jesus. And then after he does that, he's going to give us what we know as the Gospel of John. Now, for those of you that aren't aware of what goes on in scholarship, just hear me. There are many scholars, including conservative scholars, who don't believe that the writer of the Revelation is John the Beloved, nor the writer of the Gospel of John is John the Beloved. Here's the reason. The Hebrew way in which the Greek is written in Revelation, it's like an Italian trying to tell a Greek story in Greek. Whereas John's Gospel is written by someone who was a Greek scholar. And so it doesn't make it any less scripture, but it does cause for interesting conversations amongst the people that are linguists and Semitic language experts and Greek language experts. But I'm just letting you know, I'm not an expert in those things, but I have enough awareness of how to read the text to tell you that I personally believe that if the early church believed that John wrote both, it's good enough for me. And it's possible for John to have written Revelation in his Hebrew way with 
not such great Greek, and learned a lesson through self-reflection. Maybe I need some help from a good Greek scholar to help me write the gospel. But it's interesting that he gives us the answers in Revelation and goes back and tells us what the questions are in John. Because they're bookends. We tend to think Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Paul only wrote 25% of it. We think the number of things he wrote makes the volume greater. John, with John and Revelation and his epistles, equals 25% of the New Testament. Luke, in Luke-Acts, wrote another 25%. Paul wrote another 25%, and the remaining 25 are the Gospels and the other epistles. So Paul isn't the only voice in the New Testament. And so when I hear my Calvinist friends want to tell me how to interpret the Bible, but they want to denounce anything that isn't Calvinistic, I want to say, I can respect your Calvinism, but please, what about Yoannin theology or Lucan theology? Because as you and I understand Pentecost, our access to the story begins in Luke and ends in John. Paul explains to us what it means to be in Christ, but John is telling us something about this relationship that invites us into wrestling at several levels of self-reflection so that we can both be and become all that God intended us to be and become. Now, I could tell you a thousand and one stories about my journeys with Bishop and Pastor Barbara. I don't want to do that because as it is, I'm already uh, watching the clock. John is the last apostle of the resurrection and an eyewitness. Now, I want to be very careful. I'm not saying Bishop and Pastor Barbara are passing off the scene. But I am saying that I grew up in a generation where I got to hear seasoned voices that had attained a level of leadership that are no longer here. And for me, Bishop and Pastor Barbara represent the best of that generation. And I fear, I fear that there's a generation coming that's not going to know what we know. And I fear that if we don't steward all that God has placed within them faithfully, then what we're going to end up with is showboat Christianity in a millennial generation that just wants to turn Jesus into a hipster and have no idea who the real Jesus is. John is therefore aware that he's the last one that embodies what he and the other 11 walk through at several levels of self-reflection. Do you understand that John and James were Adam Sandler in anger management? (laughs) They were the sons of thunder. And they had biblical precedent for wiping out the Samaritans because when Jesus is on his way to the cross and he takes the long way to Jerusalem via Samaria, he says, go and get us a hotel at the Holiday Inn. Get us a room. And nobody wants to talk to them because Jesus has set his face like flint. Now, he's already had a major impact in Samaria. But now because he's focused on Jerusalem... All those hostilities, ethnically, are coming back. And so they treat the disciples as if Jesus is now spurning them. He's not. He's not. And so John and James come back and say, look, right here on this mountain, Elijah called down fire from heaven and killed all those folk that gave him a hard time. Let's kill them all. (laughs) Jesus says something that will rock your world which needs we need to reevaluate how we interpret Elijah. Jesus says you don't know what spirit you're of. So when we get excited about Elijah hacking to pieces the prophets of Baal, while Jesus says love your enemies and forgive them, maybe, maybe there's a level of self-reflection that the old covenant nation of Israel didn't abide by, that the text isn't there for you to justify violence. It's there for you to show you how in the journey of God we don't 
always listen in communion so we can reflect and wrestle with why are these texts telling us what they're telling us. I can't tell you how many times Bishop has opened the scripture in my journey over the years. And I said, I never saw that. I never thought about it that way. Never understood it that way. And um, there's something about the indwelling spirit that when you live long enough in communion with the triune God, you can look at a scripture and not just look at the surface plain meaning of it, but go deep into the layers of what's there until you can see the heart of Almighty God. So John is the last one. And Bishop, I would say to you and Pastor Barbara that most of your generation is not here that were major voices in the charismatic renewal. And so I, I would argue that God is entrusting you at this season with a stewardship of the mystery of Christ that yet requires teaching and writing and emptying yourself out. You know, there was a book written, Get Really Rich and Die Broke. And what the writer was trying to say was that you can't take it with you, but make sure you use it in a way that benefits other people. Jesus emptied himself. He went to the cross totally empty. It doesn't mean he stopped being God. Don't interpret kenosis as Jesus stopped being God when he took on flesh. God emptied his divinity into a human body and loved us to the point where he emptied himself out fully and said it's finished. It is not where he laid aside his divinity because then you've got a problem called the Arian heresy. Because every miracle Jesus did, he didn't do as a man. He did as who he was, God and man. Two natures, two wills, constantly revealing. The, the story of the storm at sea and the storm in the boat isn't about you can rebuke a storm. It's about who's in the boat with you. Because at the end of the first storm, they were more scared of Jesus See, we have to come to, and the boat is the church. And I would argue that because of what happened in COVID, the boat is in a stormy sea, and we don't know who's in the boat with us. And we don't need to rebuke the storm. We just need to wake up Jesus. Go ahead and knock yourself out. Move to Orlando and be with us during hurricane season and get out there in 180 mile an hour gale force winds and tell me you have the power to rebuke it. Go ahead and I'll pick you up and send you to the mortuary when you're done and give you a nice funeral. You're not God. I'm not God. Let's stop playing God and let's start being the human beings that work with God and work under God and discover that there are things we can do if we're willing to be taught at a level of things we don't know, but others have already been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, and can take us on a journey from step one to step 50 and make us realize, how come I didn't know this before? Because you didn't reflect long enough to understand when he said, follow me, where he was going to take you. John's sense of the advocate, the paraclete. John is the one that tells us he's called the paraclete. It means the one who comes alongside us. But listen carefully, really quickly. Jesus is going away so the Spirit can come. This is not an exchange of one person for another. It's not an exchange at all. This is not about three gods where Jesus goes here, the Spirit comes there. You can't separate them. They mutually indwell one another. This is not about the sun going to heaven. God is omnipresent. It's not a replacement. It's not even a shift in roles. Jesus 
says, if I go away and if the spirit comes, we will all make our abode with you. There's no change in God's way of being. It's us that change. The coming of the spirit is the altering of what you and I are capable of. And when the spirit comes, he doesn't come from out here somewhere. He comes in here. So the only way you're going to get to know who the Holy Ghost is, is not waiting for him to come from here, but to discover how he works in here. He works from the inside out. And we need seasoned patriarchs and matriarchs to bring us back to having two feet firmly on the ground with our hearts in worship, our hearts in adoration, and our hearts not quick to say things or do things that will get us in trouble and recognize, let's just wait a while and let God be God. And when we get a sense, a witness... We'll act on it. The paraclete is called another paraclete. It implies that Jesus was the first paraclete. If the paraclete is the spirit of truth, so is Jesus the truth. The disciples are going to be privileged to recognize the paraclete in the same way they were privileged to recognize Jesus. The paraclete is to be within the disciples and remain with them. Jesus also will remain with the disciples. The paraclete is to guide the disciples along the way of truth, while Jesus is the way that they're going to be guided on, and he is the truth. The paraclete is to teach the disciples just the way Jesus continues to teach the disciples. He says, I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. But when the Spirit comes, I'm going to teach you. So he's not going anywhere. The going and the comings of the triune God have nothing to do with distance and space. They have to do with mission and purpose in the economy of God. The paraclete will declare what wants to unfold. Well, Jesus declares all things that are both now and what shall be. The paraclete bears witness even as Jesus bears witness. For John, all the witness and teaching of the paraclete is about Jesus, the Spirit discloses what Jesus is up to. So the paraclete glorifies Jesus. The world doesn't accept the paraclete the same way the world doesn't accept Jesus. The world doesn't recognize the paraclete the same way the world doesn't recognize Jesus. The paraclete proves the world wrong concerning the trial of Jesus. That trial colors the entire portrait of the ministry of Jesus in John's Gospel. The paraclete can only come when Jesus ascends. And don't think of ascend as time and space. Think of ascend as moving into a place that is not limited by his physical frame. The promises of Jesus to dwell within the disciples are fulfilled in the paraclete. So, let's just take a moment and look at a story. John the Baptist has died. The greatest prophet that ever lived since the beginning of God's dealings with Israel. The greatest prophet that ever lived dies. Jack Taylor went home to be with God a few weeks back. I can't tell you all the voices that have gone in the last few years. You know, when I was in my 40s, I didn't think about my mortality much. I'm 66. I think about my mortality a lot. And I love preaching and teaching now more than I ever have. I love seeing people healed and delivered now more than I ever have. But I realize that now when I pray, it's far more precious than when I did 30 years ago because I had a lot of energy but I wasn't thinking it's not going to last and compassion and contribution comes with age it comes with seasoning and deep levels of self-reflection so that you come to a place in your life where you realize what gifts do I want to leave behind for others to grow on legacy building isn't an option none of us are called to retire we're called to empty ourselves out we're called to empty ourselves out. When evening came, 
The boat was in the middle of the sea and was alone on the land. And he, was, he saw them being beaten in their rowing because the wind was against them. And around the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And he was wanting to pass by them. Matthew tells us in his account, Peter responded and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to where you are on the water. Oh, the other thing is that the older I get, the less animated I am. I'm already out of breath. I was with TD in London. He's still as energetic as he was 36 years ago. And I just happy, happily say, knock yourself out, bro. Help yourself. When I get up there, I'm going to just pace myself because I ain't got that energy anymore. And I don't want to stain my clothes. <laughs> Bishop when we first got here, was discipling me in how to dress appropriately to be heard. And I trust you can recognize by now that I have learned how to tone down <laughs> in my wardrobe. John the Baptist is martyred. Jesus wants to find a place to process his grief. But because there's life flowing from him, he doesn't have the luxury of saying, don't follow me. We've heard many stories tonight about Bishop going out of his way, Pastor Barbara going out of her way, when it wasn't convenient. Lots of folk are hurting. Lots of folk are grieving. The number of people that died from COVID, they're not a statistic, they're people. They're people. And when you and I buy into the reports and talking points that, well, only so many died, wait till it happens in your family. That's not a statistic. That's someone Jesus died for. That's a human being made in the image of God. He loves them dearly. We have had to grieve with families in our church for the last year and a half. We just prayed through... A 50-year-old member of our church who was told by the doctors, you're never going to make it out of here alive. And we went to prayer. He made it out alive. But his cousin was in the hospital at the same time, and he died this morning at 10 o'clock. There's a lot of pain out there. People aren't listening anymore to a little bubble that says Jesus is going to make everything fine. I do think he wants to make everything fine. But pious platitudes and cliches aren't going to work. We need fathers and mothers who have known him who was from the beginning. Who can take us on a journey to understand that even when you don't have an answer, you can still trust him. He performs a Eucharistic miracle. 5,000 men plus women and children. And guess what? Because of the miracle, they wanted to make him king. Which means miracles don't always perfect us, they can pervert us. Because we want to turn it into a political arena. Because we're still looking for a political kingdom and not the kingdom of God. I don't want to get anybody upset. I'm just letting you know I've aged as a prophet. There are things I won't prophesy anymore. I've seen too much. My heart's been broken too much. I'm not going to make stuff up. But I am going to reflect at very deep levels on issues in Scripture where it doesn't seem to make sense that God seems to be silent for a season. I'm not going to lie about that anymore. I went through a very dark season from 2007 to 2010 and a half. It's a miracle I'm even standing here. That took a lot out of me. I can't tell you. I'm, I'm writing a book on it now, but it took a lot out of me. And I just want to say, if it weren't for Vinnie Manzo being with me night after night, day after day, all those three and a half years on the road, I don't know if I'd be here tonight. So, Vinnie, I love you. I'm forever indebted to you. 
And Vinny probably wouldn't have showed up if Bishop didn't say, get on the plane and go down and be with Mark. But a Eucharistic miracle caused them to say, let's put this in a bottle and sell it and brand it and market it. And Jesus said, you missed the whole point. And so he dismisses them. We'd build a big church over it. Jesus sends them home. God's not interested in individual percentage units. He's interested in forming us and shaping us into the image and likeness of Christ. And that doesn't happen by magic. That happens by being related to men and women of God who walk with us through seasons of distress and grief, pray with us through until we see miracles, but realize as well that not everybody gets a miracle. I can't tell you how many people, while I was here in the three and a half years I was here, the people we prayed for, believed God for, trusted God for, that ended up going home to heaven. I don't have the answers. And I took myself out of having to have the pressure to have the answers and had to say, God is still God. God is still God. So he sends the disciples to the other side. In other words, in spite of this, we have to keep moving forward. Covenant, the Lord's brought you a mighty long way. And the road hasn't always been smooth. The songwriter was right. The road's been rough, but you're still here. The road's been long, but you're still here. The road's been hard, but you're still here. It's not been easy to be covenantally committed when all hell breaks loose. But if you're still here, that's good news. And you're still here because of a couple that has modeled something that says even when it isn't working, God is still up to something good. So listen carefully because I'm going to sum this up really quickly. Maximus the Confessor from the 7th century, one of the great Byzantine fathers, um, talks about the fact that there is something within us because Jesus is the big Logos, capital L. We are little Logoi. We're little words in the big word. The little word in the big word is who we principally are. But then he says, then there's Tropoi, which is what we can do. And you will never know what you can do until you are pressed into a situation where you don't think you can do it. And Jesus will arrange to teach you several levels of self-reflection to bring you face to face with yourself when you have decided, I can't go there. I don't have what it takes. He sends them across. Now, listen, if it were me, I'm Italian. First time they got in the boat, he was with them, and they almost died. Or at least they thought they, they wanted to blame him for almost dying. Right? That's way, that's, these, that guy, these guys weren't Jewish. They were Italian. <laughs> Don't you care that we're perishing? My grandmother on my father's side started dying at 73. I came home one afternoon to have lunch with her because I, I was going to college on Staten Island. Grandma's house was about 20 minutes away, and Grandma always cooked a good meal. But I got there. She was in bed, and she, said, she says to me in Italian, my, my, my little grandchild, I'm dying. Please pray for me. So I did, and I said, I said Grandma, you're going to be, no, no, I'm dying. It took her 27 years to die. <laughs> we should all be so slow in dying. 27 years later, she finally died. It finally came to pass. She was almost 100. 
But what would have happened if she had just, I told her, I said, Grandma, I said, you worry about everything. And she says, so what do you want me to do? I said, let's take all that you're worrying about today and let's next Thursday at 10 o'clock for an hour. You and I are going to worry about all that stuff together. And she says, Mequan, then what am I going to do in the meantime? <laughs> if I were in the boat the first time, I'd have not gotten in the second time, especially when he says, you go, I'll meet you there. My mama didn't raise a fool. But in understanding several levels of self-reflection, Jesus is endeavoring not by ruling them the way political powers rule, but by inviting them to understand what it means to follow him and letting them consequence. He says, you go ahead of me and I'll meet you. They don't bother to ask how he's going to get there. They have no clue. They're not deep thinkers. They're, they're just they're groupies. They don't even know who he is until after Pentecost. I mean, I get very encouraged in Matthew at the end when it says he ascended and they doubted. It doesn't tell us who they were because it's you and me. I am deeply encouraged at 66 years old that some of them doubted when they saw him go up. He doesn't tell us who it is because it's all of us. You think you've got it all figured out because you're two th centuries removed from the disciples. You would do the same thing. And you do it now because you don't always discern the nearness of Christ. Because when he does speak, he's often saying something that doesn't go in line with what you want to hear because he's counterintuitive. Spiritual formation is about coming into communion with the triune life. It's not just about... It's not just about who you are. As Maximus said, it's about tropoi, it's about your mode of being. In other words, your modes, the possible modes you can walk in that you don't know you can walk in. Listen carefully as I bring this to a close. They are straining at the oars all night long. From six o'clock at night till three in the morning, they're straining at the oars. That is where the church is in America right now. We can't get to the other side. But we have a chief intercessor who not only continually prays from his vantage point on Mount Zion in heaven, he sees it all. He knows it all. He understands it all. And he's watching to see how they're processing everything he's taught them. And their hearts are hard. Don't ever think you don't have areas where your hearts are stony. The greatest miracle is when God can break up the stones in your heart. And again, if there's one thing I've learned, we've been uh, truth telling for me. Bishop used to have us get up at 4.30 in the morning and join him for prayer in the old building. I would fall asleep many times, kneeling down. Bobby was always awake seeing bananas and things. I said, what the heck has a ring of bananas got to do with Jesus? I was mad. Bishop figured it out, but I was mad. What bananas? What the heck does that have to do with Jesus? That's a word from God. I see a ring of green bananas. Yeah, I want to put that ring of green bananas right around your neck. <laughs> Didn't bother to think that God said to Jeremiah, what do you see? He says, see, I see an almond tree in blossom. I didn't bother to think about that. Bananas? There's no bananas in the Bible. <laughs> but the Spirit speaks to us in metaphors that we have to learn the language of the Spirit, not from out here, but from in here. And that means that they've had to process all that long before. Yeah. He can say, well, Bobby, let's just take a look at those unripe bananas and see what they might mean. Yeah. When we moved to Raleigh, 
I reinterpreted early will I seek thee. <laughs> and for me, early will I seek thee was, oh, that's about what's going to happen a month from now. So I'm going to start praying at three in the afternoon. Mia culpa, mia culpa, mia maxim. But you know what? After I went through my really dark season, because I couldn't sleep for three and a half years, tonight when I get on the, the bed, I'm going to start praying. I'm not going to wait till six in the morning. First thing I'm going to say is, Lord Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I'm not making a negative confession. I'm telling the truth. And then I'm going to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be on. You say, well, why don't you just pray? Because I want to do what Jesus says to do in the word. And then when I get to being able to do my petitions, I'll do that. But I'm going to do what Jesus informed the disciples to do. And I'm going to understand that in the tradition, saying, Lord Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, has a rich history in some very powerful ways. And so here they are straining at the oars, and it's not until the break of dawn that Jesus comes along walking on the water. And they are terrified. What we need right now is a generation of seasoned veterans that can teach us how to walk on water. I can promise you they can walk on water. I've seen it. I've watched it. I've understood it. And they're all sitting in that boat. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, covenant, oasis, reconciliation, God is looking for an if it's you from the movement. Yes. He and she aren't going to tell you. They're just going to go. And he intended to pass them by. One of the greatest lessons we can learn from leaders is when they don't cater to us when we think they need to. He intended to pass them by. Why? He wanted them to get in touch with their lack of self-reflection. And their real issue wasn't their fear of the storm. They were afraid of him. Why were they afraid of him? Because he could operate in arenas that they knew, no matter how hard they tried, they could not. And Peter of the 12 says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to where you are, where you are. This is more than a physical place on the ocean. This is a place internally where Jesus is with the Father and the Spirit. This is a life of communion. Jesus, where do you live? I live in continual communion with my Father by the power of the Spirit. My Father is continually emptying his love into me by the Spirit. I'm continually emptying myself into the Father by that love of the Spirit. And we live in an endless dance of love that the Greeks called perichoresis. And if you want to meet me where I am, you can't do what I do until you you fellowship my father with me because you can't have him without me because I am I became as you are that you might become as I am Saint Athanasius on the incarnation and Peter steps out of the boat and discovers tropoi a mode of existence that humans have a capability of, that until Jesus shows up and shows us what it really means to be human, we haven't got a clue. Adam was able to do it before the fall. Why? Because in order to reunite and heavenize earth, Adam becomes the composite of the one that can bring the two together. It took Jesus because Adam blew it. But Jesus comes to press the reset button to, sh 
to show us how to model reconciliation at every area of creation. But in order for that to happen, we've got to be reconciled to God, reconciled to ourselves, reconciled to others, reconciled to our purpose, and reconciled to creation. Bid me to come to where you are walking on the water. And he begins to access a level of potential, a mode of human existence that opens his eyes to a reality. Bishop, Pastor Barbara, I believe with all my heart that there is a provoking in the Holy Ghost for many that have yet to understand. Jacob, at the end of his life, pours himself prophetically into the 12 tribes, and he also crosses his hands. Because you do know God allowed him to cross his hands to lay hands on you. And the first person that has to be Peter and get out of the boat is you. Because he's on his way to the other side. The cross is painful. The cross is brutal. Bob Mumford told my generation... If you get close enough to the cross to kiss it, you're going to have a mouthful of splinters. It has nothing to do with love. It has everything to do with divine providence and sovereignty. He crossed his hands. And all the pain that's tied to that became a blessing to you. And to you. And it's okay. We don't have to understand it. We just have to say yes and embrace it. I was in the other office when Pastor Barbara and Trish were on the floor. Andre was in the other office and he said, Mark, go check out what Pastor Barbara's doing on the floor under her desk. And I peeked in, I said, this is crazy. But she got the devil out of the lady. She did. She really did. Pastor Barbara laid hands on me one night in the old building. And I had no idea. It was 15, 20 minutes later, I was still in the same position. I thought it was a minute. And God was just settling some things in my heart at that time. And um, you can't give what you don't have. Can't have what you haven't done. Can't do what you haven't been. And the reality is, is that when Peter got out, oh, I know he started to sink, but he started to sink when he was within arm's reach of Jesus. You're going to be within arm's reach. You're going to get to the other side. You're all going to get to the other side. And here's the thing. They walked back together. And by the time they got back, the entire boat had made it to the other side. Tonight is a night when we're going to affirm, after all the pain, after all the heartache, after all the sorrow, after all the struggling, after all the many deaths, after all the very vexations of spirit that can only be understood by leaders. The participants wrestle, but not like the leaders. Evie Hill, one of my favorite heroes, Bishop knew him well. I got to know him at the end of his life. Evie befriended me because of TBN. But Evie would say, Mark, when I get to heaven, I just want to be understood. I just want to be understood. So Pastor Barbara, Bishop, we're going to the other side. We're going to the other side. I'm going to ask the prophetic voices to come and join me here as we lay hands on Pastor Barbara and Bishop Garlington. Bishop, Pastor David, Eric, Ron. It's quiet in here. Told you I wasn't going to shout. I'm too old. 
Would you stretch out your hands to the bishop and Pastor Barber? I believe there's many seeds that have been sown and we've heard about it all this week that have come forth and brought more fr much fruit. But I also believe there's some seeds that are still in the ground that haven't yet come forth. And I believe God is saying that in this hour, he reserved them for this hour. He reserved them for the latter end. They haven't been sown in vain. Even though there hasn't been even an understanding of the results and, and there's been some pain and hurt because didn't I do my best? Didn't I give my best effort? Didn't I pour out? Why have there not come to fruition? But the Lord would come to encourage you and say tonight, and I feel this strongly in my spirit, that there's many seeds that are relying lying just below the surface that are about to germinate, that are about to spring up, they are about to come forth. That which you have sown in weakness, that which you have sown in the past, that's what you've labored over and given, it shall not be last, lost. Everything. You sowed in fields where there was no return. You sowed in other places where there was much return. Then there's some place you didn't sow at all and there was return. The Lord says, after many days. And right now, I want to just declare over you that you're living in that after many days. That it's going to spring forth. And you're going to see the fulfillment. And these are going to be your greatest days of fulfillment. There's prayers of healing that have been sown. There's prayers that have been sown over people. Not only physical healing, but emotional healing. And there's people that weren't able to buy it into it at that faith but that faith is going to be released that word of faith that has been spoken I release it now and Jesus, everybody just stretch your hands and say Lord we thank you that this is the time when the seed that has been sown in former days though it looks like it is low, lay dormant it is now going to come forth and Bishop, you're going to rejoice in some things that have hurt you and deeply touched your spirit and uh, caused great consternation. You're going to say, oh, Lord, that's what you meant back there. It was good that you held it off. If I couldn't see it at the time, and I couldn't understand it, why it was held. But now I know, because this is the hour of unveiling. I just saw that several things when you held up the rod up there tonight and Pastor Barbara was holding it and I was saying to myself they got to bring it down so she can hold it also that when all four of your hands were on the rod it reminded me of the story of Jacob that had the nicks in the rod in his latter days. And every cut in that rod was a memory, a experience, a story, a testimony. And that's what we heard here all night, all weekend. I want to say this because you have talked about revival more than any preacher I know. You've talked about it, you've seen it, you've experienced it. And I feel like the Lord is telling me to tell you, the beginning of the miracle ministry that you saw, even others have, as is heavy stuff, that you even saw Kuhlman have, is about to begin. And do not say, why me? But the Lord would say, because you kept pursuing me. The words you gave in Buffalo three weeks ago about the raising of the dead was the beginnings of the signs of the miraculous ministry. For God says, I'm looking for people that will do miracles again. And I'm looking for fathers and mothers to do miracles. 
Now I'm hearing bones crack in my ear and you're going to see a lot of that because that has to be done to transfer that kind of faith to the next generation. There's a generation coming up that has never seen it. They hear about it, but they've never really seen it. And God says, I'm not through with you or with you. Watch what I do. You'll do more miracles in these days in the meetings that you have than you will preaching and teaching. For the Lord says, I will show up quickly. As soon as you get to places, I will show up in cities. I will show up on platforms and I will be there to heal the sick and deliver people. And the mighty power of my spirit will move whole congregations to repentance and to consecration and to a further pursuit of me, says the Lord. And God is going to, I just see this in the spirit, but there's a picture over your head, over both your heads tonight. <clears throat> and it's just fresh oil just falling on you. It's just falling on both of you. Physical strength is going to be a sign for you to run even faster. And the oil is going to make things so smooth. Man. Favor is going to come to you, Bishop, like, like you taught all of us about favor. It's going to just be amazing. And I'm not talking about political stuff. This is huge. And God says favor is going to come to you in so many different ways. That you're going to say things like, if I, know, if I knew it was going to be this easy, <laughs> I would have took the rod a long time ago. <laughs> But these are the beginning days of the miraculous ministry of the Garlingtons, says the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. While Mark was busy speaking, the Lord showed me the bridge that you've built into many people's lives. You've been a bridge builder across cultures, across nations, across many different things. But God said, now I am building the bridge for you to cross over to the next dimension. And the dimension you're going into is going to be a dimension that not many men and women walk in. And what, what has come from, it's come from your faithfulness. It's come from the fact that you're a promise keeper. And you gave the Lord your promise. You gave the Lord your yes years ago. And you've sacrificed everything for that yes. And because you've sown greatly from everything that you have, you're going to enter a dimension of great authority and great power. And God's going to use you in a very profound way in these coming days. And there's going to be a cloud of witnesses that are going to follow you through into that dimension. I believe that you're going to be like Moses, that are going to lead a generation through dry land cross out from tribulation and hardship into a place of knowing God like Mark was speaking about is coming to the other side and getting to know something and that's what I saw when Mark was speaking I saw the bridge that God is building for you that you can cross over to the other side and I want to just tell you I'm honored to even be in your presence because you're a man of great integrity you've been a great father you've been a great leader and uh, I love you. And then I love you too. And I know that God's put miracles within you. And you think that, you know, okay, Sarah was so old before she could give birth. But you're going to give birth to something fantastic in these coming days. And you're going to start touching people with healing in a way that's going to set the captive free. Not just physical, but emotional healing. Healing from depression. Healing from suicide. And it's going to come from your voice. The authority in your voice and the touch of your hand is going to set the captive free. So I just declare to you today that blessing and honor will follow you all the days of your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody stretch your hand toward them now. 
Father God, we thank you for these dedicated servants who have sacrificially given their lives for the kingdom of God, that people could be restored, that people could be lifted up, people could be delivered, body, soul, and spirit. And now we thank you for the bridge that is set before them. We thank you that you have now given them an open door that no man can close. And Lord, today, as they enter into this new dimension and into this new season of God, we thank you that they're going to be able to do it without, with joy. There's going to be no fear. There's going to be no lack of provision. There's going to be no lack of opportunity. There is going to be no lack of uh, direction and understanding. They're not going to be left alone. But there's going to be a greater anointing, a greater understanding, a greater wisdom, a greater dimension of the Holy Spirit that's going to come upon them. Lord, I just come to... I just feel the Lord wants us to heal your hearts and heal your spirits in the midst of this. Amen. There's great joy, but there's also great emotion. <laughs> and the Lord says, I'm coming to heal every aspect of your life, every attack that has come against you, every weapon that's formed against you and has spoken against you. I come against it in the name of Jesus. And as a people, we tear it down. We put a divine immunity around about them, a divine wall of protection. And Satan is not going to be able to penetrate them not going to be able to get through this wall because they're going to be divinely covered by the grace of God. And Lord, I just thank you. <laughs> this is a new day. Everybody say this is a new day. New day. And they're going to rejoice in it. Amen. Beloved, as we bring this to a close, I want to just take an opportunity to invite us to present a love gift to Bishop and Pastor Barbara. I know you're used to that, but we never want to take that for granted. And I want to invite us to become aware that saying thank you in Scripture often is tied to finances. We all know that you're, you're a house that's well taught. The issue isn't whether they need the money. The issue is we need to give it to say thank you. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to prepare your hearts and prepare your offerings. I'm going to invite you to radical generosity. You can give either by making a check payable to Bishop and Pastor Barbara. You can text. You can go online. Those of you at home, I invite you to go online or to text as we prepare to say thank you to the man and woman of God. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. that, Lord, you never fail us. You never forsake us. You are ever with us. You never go away. You simply invite us in your ascension to make space for us to discover modes of human existence and potential and capability we didn't have. Father, as we prepare to bless Bishop and Pastor Barbara, there's not one of us that can say they didn't make room for us. They made room for us. And I thank you, Lord God, that that is part of a legacy that will endure for generations to come. And so, Father, make room in all of our hearts 
to model that for others. To consider every interruption an invitation, every inconvenience a beckoning to self-reflection, and an invitation to follow you until we become more and more like you. Bless them now. We invoke your blessing that makes rich and adds no sorrow as we lift these gifts before your throne. And may they rejoice in that which is given. And may you multiply it to them a thousandfold. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've got envelopes, the... If you're giving online or text to give the drop down menu, choose the word legacy. That that designates that separate from the conference for Bishop and Pastor Barb. Thank you, Jesus. We'll give you another moment for that. And and just as we as we're about to close this, um, we would like the CCOP board and the reconciliation board members. If you could just come up here, stand here. No one's going to be sharing anything, uh, but we just want the church to recognize those board members and also uh, have us just stand in support of everything that's taking place. So CCOP board, RMI board, if you'll just come stand and face the people, that would be wonderful. As you exit today, there's uh, uh, a reception in the lobby area. You'll receive um, some cake and such to take with you as you leave. But our board members just want to come up and we just want to publicly acknowledge and, and stand in agreement. And there's so many great men and women of God here um, as well, but just come on and let, I mean, I'll just kind of step back. Yes, sirs. They're making their way forward. Ushers are still waiting on us. If you need an envelope there in front of you. And of course, all these great men and women of God here, guest ministries and such, they would be doing the exact same. But we just agree and we affirm with everything that took place this week and particularly tonight in support of Bishop and, and Nana. And we just want to just say yes to that. We love you so much. And all in favor, say aye, <laughs> as boards do. God bless you. Thank you so much, Fellowship. I know that you want to be able to say hello. Thank you so very much for coming to Presence 2021. And on the screen, you'll see a graphic for reconciliation. Our very next meeting is the gathering. It's in Columbus, and it is on these days. Well, there it is. It's on these dates, October 4th through 6th. We can't wait to see our reconciliation members. You are going to get a whole lot more information coming uh, regarding that. Thank you, and God bless you. Good night.